Good morning. I hope this finds you doing well, and I hope this finds you doing less frustrated than I am with our technology right now, as this is not the first time I'm recording what you're seeing. Uh, the technology did not work with me, so I hope that it works better this time. Uh, I do want to share an announcement uh, before we get into um, our readings, prayers, and scripture for, this, for the day. Uh, I was talking with our district superintendent about what the guidance will be with regards to when and how we reopen. And the guidance from the bishop is uh, that uh, churches should pay attention and be guided by the wisdom of their county health officials, the uh, Shelby County Health Department. And so I have begun talking to Audrey, uh, who is in charge of that, um, to be listening to her. And we will be guided by what, what she recommends as we look to when we will be reopening. It will not be this week or next week or the week after. It's still going to be a bit, I have a feeling. Uh, but And we will have to modify aspects of what our worship looks like to, to make it work out well. And I will have more details about that as I uh, work out what, what it is that will be best for us, what will be safest for us. If you have any questions about this, uh, please just let me know. Call, uh, just let, let me, let's, let's chat. So the uh, readings for this day come from 1 Corinthians 15 and John 20. In 1 Corinthians 15, we read what Paul is saying to the church that is struggling to understand what happens uh, after the resurrection. We read him saying, What I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised and perishable, and we will all be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death? is your sting. The gospel reading from this day comes from the gospel according to John, the 20th chapter. Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails, my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have, you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. This week we continue asking the questions that come up around the Easter. Like what, what does Easter change? Last week we looked at the way that uh, as a forgiven people, we are people who uh, extend that forgiveness to others. As people who have, who have been given a second chance, we then give second chances to others in a way that is wise, in a way that, that is not uh, blind, a way that engages and accepts that uh, there are things that are, are broken and how do we handle that this week we move on to ask this question around what changes in us like what changes in me in my body in myself 
after the resurrection. We, we believe that the resurrection, it, 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 well, it is the keystone of our faith, that, that Jesus died for our sins, and on the other side of that death, it, Jesus is resurrected, and we follow him through death into the resurrection in the kingdom that is to come. And then what? I mean, that's that's the, what we're looking at today, the, the what's next for us. As we look at Paul today, Paul in this 15th chapter of the first letter to the church at Corinth, he is discussing this, and it's worth reading the whole chapter, uh, but he's discussing as much as he can, and he is pointing out that Jesus did die for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and raised on the third day, on the third day that this is the first fruits of what is to come. And so it's the first fruits of what is to come, and so we can look to him and in the same way that we can look at how a seed has to go down into the ground before it can grow into something that's co that is completely different and new and amazing, right? And so in the same way, we will join in following Jesus through going down into the earth before we come, uh, we are resurrected in, into this new life. As he puts it, uh, the perishable body must put on imperishability. Now, he doesn't say much more in detail about that. Because we, we live in this balance between what we know and what we can't know. Paul, what Paul would have known is what, what we know, that Thomas has his doubts. And Thomas, uh, and Thomas is worth some time just looking, paying attention to Thomas, because he is not just someone who doubts, he's also a very bold fellow and worthy of respect. But Thomas is the one who, he, he wants to be able to touch the scars before he believes, and that's what he gets. Like, here, put your hand into my, my side, Thomas, is what Jesus tells him. And then it leads to Thomas making the cleanest, most direct confession of faith in all of Scripture, my Lord and my God. And, uh, but it happens because Thomas touches scars. And that Jesus had scars is an amazing sentence to say, because it makes it very clear that there is a connection. If Jesus is the first fruits, if Jesus goes before us and we will follow in the same manner, Jesus had scars and so will we. Scars are a reminder, a connection to what has happened in our past. And so it's not like we are going to be cut off that all that has happened before. The scars that I have, I, I do have some, some scars. I, most of them involve knives. And uh, I have scars, and I learn lessons from them. And that's, that's not going to be something that I, I forget in the life, the resurrection that is to come. And, and it's also good to note that... They're scars, they're not wounds. Thomas does not touch the wounds of Jesus, Thomas touches the scars of Jesus. A scar is a wound that has healed. And so to say that Jesus has scars is, is to say that everything that has been broken has been made whole and right and has been healed. And that is a very good thing to hear. So our resurrection bodies will be healed and will be made whole. And yes, there will be scars, but they will be reminders of the stories that have got us to where we are. And... While that says something that we can know about the, the bodies, of, of re the resurrection bodies, we also, there's things that we don't know that are going to be changed, that are going to be different. And this is, we, we see this when we see how uh, the people, there are two people who are walking home to Emmaus it, after the events of what we now call Holy Week, the, the events of Easter, and they're walking home, and they know Jesus well enough so that they, when Jesus shows up and they don't realize who it is, they can describe all the events that have happened. And they can lament that what they had hoped for did not happen. And so they know Jesus. They don't recognize Jesus who is walking with them. They only recognize Jesus when Jesus sat down with them and broke bread with them. And again, there's a whole sermon right there about how meeting Jesus and inviting someone in and breaking bread together. There's something to be said about that. But for our purposes, it is, what is significant is Jesus was not recognized. 
Yes, there are scars, so there's a connection to the past, but there's something that has changed such that people that knew him did not recognize him. And so that's what Paul has to work with, those, those stories, those moments. And so that's why Paul can't be very, very much more specific than saying our perishable bodies must put on imperishability, that Jesus is the first fruits. We just don't know a lot about the details of what that fruit is like. What I find to be far more helpful and hopeful and enjoyable to contemplate uh, is to look not just about what happens to bodies in the resurrection, but to look at what happens to our relationships. And to look at this, we look at what Jesus has to say about marriage. There were a group of people, this is in uh, Luke 20, that come to Jesus and they're trying to trip him up and they challenge Jesus with a hypothetical question. They, they propose a question based in the practice of, of leviterate marriage. And what leviterate marriage is, is if a husband and a wife get married and the husband dies before they have a male heir to carry on the name, the wife has to marry the husband's next oldest brother. And then the first child they have carries on the name of the first brother. And so this is called a leviterate marriage, and it means that you have to pay a lot more attention to whoever your brothers-in-law are going to be, just in case. So the, the question that is posed to Jesus is, keeping in mind leviterate marriage, if a woman marries a man, and he, and he dies before there is an heir, and then she marries the, the next brother, the second brother, and he dies before there is an heir, and this just keeps on happening. And then the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, all the way through the seventh brother. She marries sequentially each of the seven brothers of this family, and they all die before having any heirs, so she keeps on having to marry brother after brother after brother. In the kingdom that is to come, Jesus, the question is, to whom shall she be married? And Jesus looks at them, and it is worth quoting his response in full. He says to them, Those who belong to this age may marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself shows in, in the story about the bush where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, which is a, the present tense, that not that they were, but that he is the God of these people who are still alive. Now, he is God not of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. So they are neither going to be, will neither marry nor be given in marriage. That's what Jesus says. Neither marry nor be given in marriage in the kingdom which is to come in the resurrection. It is something that we say in our marriage vows, till death do us part. How long are you married? You're married until death do you part. That's how long you're married. So what do we make of that? Why are you married until death do you part? What marriage is at its fundamental, in the Christian understanding, is a practice of friendship that helps us become more Christ-like. It is the practice of, of, of service, the practice of humility, the practice of patience, the practice of being there for someone through thick and thin, through th sickness and in health, right? That's our vows that, that we make when we get married. And so marriage is this lifetime of becoming more like Christ with the help of this person who is your constant person to practice with. Like, I can love my neighbors. I have a bunch of neighbors. The neighbor that is closest to me, the neighbor that I practice loving most often, is the neighbor who I see first thing in the morning as I wake up. All right, so to say that we are married until death do us part is to say that when we have entered into the kingdom that is to come, when the resurrection of our bodies, 
It is not just our bodies that are transformed, but our relationships. For, for no longer will it just be that there is one person that is our closest neighbor that we are giving ourselves to most fully and receiving from most fully, right? Because in, in, our, in a lifetime, in, in my lifetime, I can only do this to, with one person at a time because it is, well, it, it takes a lot of effort and time to be married to one person, right? But in the kingdom that is to come, it is to say that there will be an eternity to treat everyone like this. Right? This is part of, of when, when pe someone asks me, will I know my husband or will I know my wife in heaven in the kingdom that is to come? The answer is yes, of course you will. But that's not the best part. The best part is that every single follower of Jesus, you will see and rejoice with and rejoice at seeing with the same level of joy as when you see your husband or your wife. It's not just the bodies that are transformed, it is our relationships. This is a reflection of our understanding of who God is, that God is known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons, fully giving, fully receiving. You cannot extract them from each other. To say Son is to immediately imply there is a Father, right? There is always this community. And so the kingdom that is to come in heaven is to say that we are in a place in which we have been invited into the family life of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are joined in into this relationship of fully giving of ourselves, of having joy th that we have practiced with. We have practiced having all of our life with, with a spouse, if we, have, uh, if we have gotten married, right? We have practiced having all of our lives for, with that spouse is practiced for having that joy with every follower of Jesus in the kingdom that is to come. And so to answer the question about what changes in the resurrection, the answer is a lot, and we don't fully understand it. Our bodies change, and there's a scar, there are scars, so we are connected to our past. But there are things that are changed that we don't understand and we cannot name yet, because we're not there. But more importantly, what also changes our, is our relationships. Being invited into the life of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is utterly transformative, such that... We are married until death do us part in preparation to have that level of amazing relationship with God and with each of the followers of Jesus. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we pray all the time the prayer that you taught us to pray. And in doing so, we pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, as it will be in the kingdom that is to come. And so we pray once more that your will be done, not just in general, but we pray that your will be done in us, such that we can look towards each day as an opportunity to practice for your kingdom, to walk towards what you make possible. And we give you thanks for this, for without you it would not be possible. Without the forgiveness you offer, the power of the resurrection, we would be stuck in our kingdom, not headed towards yours. And so we pray this day for all whom we love, for all who serve. We pray this day for all who suffer. We pray this day for all those who wait. We pray for all those who lead. We pray for each of them that thy will be done in their lives. We pray for this and give you thanks. Amen. My friends, I hope you are doing well. I look forward to the day we can gather again. Peace be with you. Amen.